Okay, you are watching video lecture number 29, uh, entitled Protestant Christianity as a Social Force. We have four sections today. Uh, first, we're going to look at a Republican religious order, then the Second Great Awakening, religion and reform, and women's new religious roles. So the so-called Great Awakening of the 18th century had introduced America uh, to America the variant of Protestant Christianity that we call evangelicalism. Uh, this is a form of Christian faith, faith that stressed emotion over doctrinal correctness, uh, judged people less by their social, social station or their education than by the genuineness of their call, uh, and demanded of all believers that they work to share the good news with others. In the years following the revolution, massive social change, most especially the surge of white settlers into the West, uh, brought on a counter-movement to bring order to the new societies. Uh, a new uh, evangelizing institution, the Camp Meeting, brought thousands together in massive displays of religious fervor. While many outside observers were appalled or bemused by the reported excesses of these revivals, uh, they introduced a new order to the frontier recruiting large numbers of souls into local congregations. While older churches had been organized from the top down, uh, the newer congregations were voluntary societies that joined together into a kind of new church uh, called the denomination. Denominations existed less to enforce orthodoxy uh, than to organize missionary efforts to combat what they feared was the rampant infidelity uh, and social chaos accompanying geographic and economic expansion. Uh, in time, uh, religious folk began to organize across denominational lines, creating a benevolent empire of national organizations. Uh, these denominations and agencies printed newspapers, Bibles, books, and tracts, uh, spread them across the nation through the postal system uh, and their networks of local affiliates. Uh, and they deployed armies of missionaries both at home and abroad. In so doing, they played a major role in tying Americans together into a national community. Uh, thanks to both revival enthusiasm and organizational genius, uh, evangelical precepts increasingly pervaded American life. Uh, biblical themes and rhetoric shaped the ways in which Americans understood their world and the ways in which they discussed the world with each other. Uh, evangelicals were pleased at this development, but wished to go much, much further. Uh, while they were happy to live in a land without an established church, they nonetheless believed that public as well as private life uh, should be dominated by their own understanding of Christian principles. Uh, theirs was hardly a pluralistic vision of the promise of America, uh, for it shut out not only non-Christians, but also Roman Catholics. Uh, but it also made the evangelical mission uh, one of saving society as well as individuals. If Americans were in fact a new chosen people of God, their country needed to conform to God's will, a notion that in the hands of a Frederick Douglass, an Abraham Lincoln, or Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, would become a powerful force for change. So let's look closer at the different sections here, starting with our first section, a Republican religious order. In 1776, the Virginia Constitutional Convention issued a Declaration of Rights guaranteeing all Christians the free exercise of religion. After the Revolution, an established church and compulsory religious taxes were no longer the norm in America. Thomas Jefferson's Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom made all churches equal before the law, uh, but granted financial support to none. The separation, then, of church and state was not complete because most church property and ministers were exempt from taxation. Many states enforced religious criteria for voting and holding office, uh, although the practice was often condemned by Americans. Our next section is the Second Great Awakening. Churches that prospered in the new nation uh, were those that proclaimed doctrines of spiritual equality, uh, 
and govern themselves in a relatively democratic fashion. Uh, through revivals, Baptist and Methodist preachers reshaped the spiritual landscape of the South and the Old Southwest, uh, and revivalists were particularly successful at attracting those who had never belonged to a church before. Uh, during the Second Great Awakening, the Congregationalist, Episcopalian, and Quaker churches grew slowly in membership, while the Methodist and Baptist churches grew spectacularly uh, and became the, the nation's largest religious denominations. Uh, Methodist, uh, what we call circuit riders, uh, established new churches in remote areas by bringing families together for worship and then appointing lay elders to enforce moral discipline until the circuit riders return. Uh, evangelical ministers adopted practical preaching methods, uh, theatrical gestures, and a flamboyant style to attract converts. Christian republicanism in the South added a sacred dimension to the ideology of aristocratic republicanism. Uh, while Southern blacks ad adapted the teachings of the Protestant churches to their own needs, black Christianity uh, developed as a complex mixture of stoical endurance and emotional fervor and encouraged slaves to affirm their spiritual equality with whites. Our third section then is religion and reform. Ministers began stressing human ability and individual free will, making American religious culture more compatible with Republican doctrines of liberty and equality. For some, individual salvation became linked with social reform through the concept of religious benevolence. Unlike the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening fostered cooperation between denominations. So we don't have the old lights versus the new lights this time. Uh, Protestants across the nation saw themselves as part of a single religious movement that could change the course of history through politics. Because the Second Great Awakening aroused such pious enthusiasm in many Americans, religion became a central force in political life. Uh, some urged the United States to become an evangelical Christian nation dedicated to religious conversion at home and abroad. So lastly, we will look at women's new religious roles. The upsurge in religious enthusiasm provided women with new opportunities to demonstrate their piety and even to found new sects. Uh, for example, those like Mother Ann Lee and Jemima Wilkinson. Uh, women in more mainstream churches uh, who formed the majority in many denominations uh, became active in religion and charitable work, partly because they were excluded from other spheres of public life, uh, and partly because ministers relied increasingly on women to do the work of the church. The new practice of having church services for male and females together was accompanied by greater moral self-discipline. Um, women's uh, religious activities and organizations were scrutinized uh, and sometimes seen as subversive of the greater social order. Uh, by the 1820s, mothers across the nation had founded local maternal associations to encourage Christian child rearing. Religious activism advanced as female education and churches established seminaries uh, and academies where girls received intellectual training and moral instruction. Women gradually displaced men then as public school teachers uh, because women had few other opportunities uh, and they were willing to accept lower pay than men. Along with Republican and capitalist values, these, uh, uh, this Protestant religious impulse formed the core of an emerging national identity. Even as the citizens of the North and the South defined republicanism and economic progress in distinctly different ways. Okay, this does conclude video lecture number 29 then. Please answer the review questions at this time and continue on with your work.